On behalf of the University's Lectures Committee and the Design Center, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this focus event this evening. As part of the festival events, this lecture is particularly unique, primarily because of the lecturer. Approximately 12 years ago, an archaeologist made the following statement, and I quote, Within the awesome setting of nature, I seek a manly setting within which we can sense the grace of being and becoming, end quote. That archaeologist is our speaker tonight, Mr. Soleri. Mr. Soleri was born in Italy in 1920. He received a doctorate with honors from the Polytechnic Institute in Turin. In 1947, he came to live in the United States. He's an architect, an artist, and a philosopher whose visions begin to advance the environmental concepts which go far beyond many of our associative limits today. Many of his works have advanced some ideas which include some visionary projects such as the tubular bridge dating back to 1947, a town on a table mountain dated about 1959, several projects which have included many of the urban concepts which I'm sure he will speak more of in his presentation tonight. A couple of his executed works include The House in the Desert, a ceramics factory in Salerno, Italy, and particularly one very well-known project, his own, the Earth House in Scottsdale, Arizona. He also has established a summer study program which has generated many continuous projects and perhaps initiated from the uh, several silt house projects which he has uh, generated. Well known to most of you, in 1969 he published a book which was an exercise in miniaturization, and the book is about yay big, hardly fits on any shelf, titled Archaeology, the City in the Image of Man. In addition to this book, he has also published his sketchbook, which uh, has followed the publication of this earlier one. The work and philosophy of Mr. Soleri are unique. Professional journals, have very frequently cited his work and have made many articles regarding it. In a foreword to his book, Peter Blake wrote, and I quote, Mr. Soleri presents ideas that will challenge just about everything all the rest of us keep doing day after day after day, end quote. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a real humanist, Mr. Soleri. Can you hear in the back? Can you hear from there? No. Can you hear now? <laughs> from the back. Okay. I have problems with the English language as you can find out immediately. So I, uh, I begin with the props that the slides are. They help me to uh, illustrate the work and having to do with environment anyhow, it, the visual aspects are pretty important, though they are not the only ones. Uh, the, I have about 280 slides, so I'm going to go pretty fast with them. The first half is about the Cosanti Foundation the buildings and the environments that uh, we have been setting up in the desert in Arizona. It used to be desert, now it's suburbia. And the second part, we'll have some models, and at the end we'll have the, the Arcosanti building, the model and the beginning of the construction, a very small beginning. 
if you like to interrupt me during the slides, uh, please do. Um, but I hope that at the end we have a debate or a question and answer or a dialogue or, dialogue or whatever you want to call it. I think we are going to start. We are living uh, not far from Scottsdale, which is not far from Phoenix. And uh, we've been there for a number of years. I used to do ceramics by uh, cutting holes in the ground and doing slip casting. I uh, used the same technique. The soil was deep, about six feet deep, very homogeneous, uh, a temptation for, uh, to do something with it. <coughs> so I transfer this, I use the same technique of slip casting, but, and I cast shells. And this was the first shell that I cast by molding the soil and then pouring a thin shell of concrete. And this was the roof for uh, the earth house. It's a little house about 30 feet inside. It has a fireplace in the center and then rooms around, fireplace and bathroom. Uh, that was pretty successful, so uh, a little later on, I built the studio and the ceramics work area. The same technique, piling up the, the soil, packing it, shaping it, cutting some details, and then <coughs> pouring, pumping, organizing a shell in concrete. Later on, we did the north studio, which is this one here. And we began to have uh, young people interested in this work, so we started to have summer workshops. And we built the remaining structures, this shell, which is part of the ceramics, the, those structures which are part of the foundry, a larger house for the apprentice with a patio and a swimming pool, and lately uh, this drafting room on three vaults. I'm showing some of the buildings, <coughs> and then I'm showing some of the techniques this is uh, this building here. It's where it's a breeze, breezeway, a passageway, and we assemble ceramics there and we sell ceramics. This is a, a passage, passageway going into this patio. This is the little drafting room, the first one. The North Studio, you have to see this is a mound <coughs> that has been shaped, cut, and then uh, we use granite in this uh, instance. And then we got a bulldozer and cut this trench, and came inside and excavated this volume. Uh, the area where we do the ceramics work, the north patio of the larger house, we call the cat cast, this house, because the bulldozer shaped the, the, the outline of the roof before the casting. A pat, the patio of this house, the same one. This is the little living room of the first experiment. This was the shell we cast by moving from clay into concrete. Uh, this floor is about six feet below grade, but it's not an underground house. It's a house built below grade, but it has a, a good south patio and a north patio, and a skylight, and so on. This is the, one of the three uh, vaults for the drafting room. And some of the techniques. <coughs> this is a frame, a metal frame that rotates uh, at the end, at the center here. <coughs> it has planks, and then on the planks we have silt. So what we are doing there, we, are, we finish the molding of the silt, we put some wax paper on to, to have panels like um, textures and colors in the, f in the final surface. And now we are pouring this section. We have been pouring uh, three sections there, and we are going to go on the other side and pour the other section. And uh, so we went up with 10 of those. 
diaphragms supporting the whole shell because it, it cannot be self-supporting until you get the key stone, which is that one. And here we are cutting. So this is the seal, this is the negative, and this is the positive. And then you take off the, the scaffolding. You see the paper that are hanging it has to be mm, brushed off, peeled off. And that's the color of the seal. Uh, this is a skylight above the ceramics. And it used to be in paper, cardboard, and resin. Then we got into plastic and concrete. This is the molding of a wall uh, that encloses the, the ceramic kiln. And this is soil again has been packed with some moisture and then has been uh, there's a little coating of, of cement to make to pick up the details. Now we are pouring the shell and then we are going to demolish the mold. There you see the the shell itself after this has been taken away off. <clears throat> this is about 31 feet in diameter. We are shaping a, um, a vault. There's going to be a storage place. And uh, this girl is doing some finishing. And afterwards, we put some plastic to get again this uh, panel kind of um, results. Now we are pumping the concrete to make the shell. And there you see the, this is the negative, which is going to be destroyed. And this is the positive. This is the shell, the resulting structure with a difference in color and textures. Sometimes we, we use color. And instead of painting the, the, the concrete itself, we paint the soil. This is the, the fixing of the paint and also the fixing of the shape before we put the reinforcing on. And we do the casting. By using the bulldozer, you cut quite a bit of trenching. You do quite a bit of trenching. so. For many years, we kept those trenches, trenches in, uh, in soil. And there you see them shaped in geometric forms. And later on, we transferred them in concrete by pouring a thin shell concrete. But we dripped uh, mud on top of it before it was set so that the color is somehow the same color of the desert around the soil. We are building a, an apse, which is about a quarter of a sphere in this case, and uh, by, build, by casting conical arches using wood forms. And that's, this is the third arch. And then to conclude this structure, we precast an arch by using a silt bed shaped, as you see there. We are putting the rebars there, and then we're casting. And this is the, the arch after the casting and the washing out of the silt. Uh, we again, we left the keystone uncast, and we are going to cast it on the spot. The assemblage of this arch, this was about 10, eight or nine years ago, I would say. The two last sections before setting them up. And the keystone cast in place. And then uh, we precast some of those small structures. This is a tree house. This is a bench. There's a table there and owning. And you can see a person reading there. It's a good lookout on the desert. Now you see only roofs mostly. You think you could try on the uh, This is, could you try to move it, center it, center the, this, the screen. Thank you. Uh, this is the cat casting. We cast the roof first 
and then and now we are casting the walls. Uh, this is gunniting. This is casting by hand. And then we are going to go inside with the machine and dig out the volume. And this is the the texture of the ceiling after the digging is, has been done. This is the glazing line. This is one of the two uh, light wells inside of the house with the tree shading the roof. Those are um, uh, railroad ties that we used as supports. Then we precast little panels and we use them as dividers inside of the house, making little rooms there. There's a living room, a kitchen, and uh, a number of rooms. This is the beginning of the setting up the poles for the canopy that shelters the swimming pool. Those are 12 telephone poles, power poles. On the square plan, they are cast into concrete beds. And then we, we push soil around them. We cut this shape, which is the form for this shell. We paint it with soil. This is styrofoam is going to be liquefied after the casting so the, the slab can raise along the poles. Uh, color, uh, cement and sand to, to somehow fix the color and the shape. Then the rebars are put on and then the shell cast. And this is the shell after this part of the form has been removed before the lifting. It's a 30 tons, 32 by 32 shell. And there you see the colors. And then we, we begin the, the digging for the swimming pool. And to finish the surface so that we would get a good, a good clean, surface to clean, we got a crew of uh, professionals, which is, and it happened very rarely. All, all the buildings you saw were made by us, which means non-professional skills. But those are, this is a crew of uh, specialized finishers. And then it was just about something we couldn't stand was irresistible. So we, we came in and we painted the whole thing. <laughs> it, was, it was the day before Easter, I think, and it was like painting the inside of a big egg. And uh, we tried to do it fast so that we got a good bond, uh, like a fresco, with the, with the, uh, the coating, the white surface. We are uh, making concrete sticks by uh, pouring slabs, but uh, using dividers, metal dividers. So you end up by having sticks after they're cured, they can be assembled in a structure. And uh, we put um, wire then inside of them by throwing thousands of little wires in the mixer. And those are giving some kind of a diffuse uh, tensile strength to the structure. And then we assemble them in this fashion, casting monolithical rings to join the two layers. And I'm, I have a template there. I'm cutting this top, top shape in soil. There we are doing this building, and then we are, we are beginning. We are doing also another building there for the model activities, models activities. And this is this uh, building made of sticks, and concrete. And um, it has, again, it's, a, it's an apse. And it's exposed to the south. And it has the, the ability of cutting off the summer sun, which is very high on the horizon, and accepting the winter sun. So it works very well as a sun trap and a sunshade, according to the season. So this area becomes a, a nice area to work and it just happened that this is the foundry area. I'm using this shape in a much larger scale now where we are building the Arcosanti structure for a similar reason. 
this is the rough mound which has been molded into this mound and that's the process of casting we incorporated all the mistakes we make in the building itself so it's going to be there staring at us for good this there was a crack here in the in the mold in the soil because we were using we are going to two verticals amount and we didn't pack the the mound enough so we left the crack visible by a change in the nature of the of the surface <coughs> this is another apse. It's, this one is built in horizontal layers, beginning from the top and coming down to the bottom. So you start from the ceiling, you end up with the found foundations. Uh, the students are putting their own designs in the panels. And there you see the same design. This is a drafting room and model room, and this was made by uh, getting flannel cloth three feet wide, dipping it into plaster, and setting it on a, on a metal form that you don't see there, and they get stiff and rigid on, and dry on that form, and they are assembled on this scaffolding. They are sewn together. They, we coat them with, con with cement to make them a little stronger, and then we put the reinforcing and then we do the shell, which you see there. So the inside is show this permanent form made in, in uh, flannel. This was the first flannel segment put up. This is a sewer pipe. Uh, it makes a fairly good little studio. It's about nine and a half feet in diameter. And there you see the ribs in flannel. We are making the arcology mo models there. <coughs> uh, we had three volts going one way, and then we have those connecting uh, cross bolts. Those are power poles. This is the sewer pipe. That's the glazing. We used to have one summer workshop, then we got into three or four. Last year we had 11. We started in March, we ended in November. This year we started in February. We are going to end in December. Every Monday, every first Monday of each month, we get a new group. Last year we had 290 people involved. This year I would like to have the same number. And I have some material at the end of the slides, at the end of the conversation, if you're interested. As you see, I'm recruiting in a recruiting campaign. But those are uh, meetings that we have every week or twice a week discussing the work. And now all the work goes on on the new site, at the Arcosanti site. We support the, the work of the foundation uh, by selling bells also. And those are ceramics bells. Those are bronze bells. We go from very small ones to very large ones. This is the bed, uh, a foundry sand. Um, we are cutting designs into the mold so that each bell has a little variation, like those little things there. This is a group of bells. Those links are made here from uh, styrofoam originals that I cut, and then they are cast in bronze or aluminum. I think we can skip that one. Oh, thank you. This is uh, an, uh, a star of um, cast into aluminum. Again, an aluminum piece from star of um, original. A uh, few years ago, we were asked to, to do a uh, outdoor theater in Santa Fe for the school, for the Indian school. And they asked us to use the same procedure because they like the character of the buildings at, at the foundation in Arizona. So here we are building this, excuse me, this outdoor theater. And there is a staging uh, about 20 feet below level grade. 
And then we go up, the, you can have that performing things going on at different levels, including the bridge there, the roof, and also this runway, which is the runway we are making now. Part of the runway. Uh, we are building the forms for uh, those two columns. There are the columns with stairways. We are shaping and fixing this surface. We are molding, after molding the general shape, we are putting uh, plywood boxes on top of this curved surface for those two sides. <coughs> a view from the, the beginning of the, of the runway coming down. There's a bridge there, the light towers. And the stage area showing different texture, the soil, the wood, the uh, sedimentary embankment that we cast against. This is the very rough wall I was telling you. This is sedimentary uh, cut from the runway looking down. Those are some of the bridges. I, I tend to work in series. In other words, when I have an idea, I try to work around and come up with different kinds of aspects or different approaches. And those are bridges that I made in a few months, and they were made originally in silt. They are about six, seven feet in length, so you cut into a soft stone, which is like which is the silt after it's been packed uh, tight into a box, and then you open the box, you cut the shape that you see there, and then we translate them into transfer them into a plaster mold by a three-way process. Uh, they contain other things like uh, um, view, uh, sightseeing, uh, viewpoints, and uh, maybe um, restaurants or places to stop and so on. This is another tubular bridge. This is a tubular structure, and uh, instead of being just a bridge, it's also a ramp. You can go from this side to that side, and then come down to the valley, or vice versa. You come up, you go to one ring, ring, or the other ring. This is a double cantilever bridge. The landscapes there. The same bridge. This is a sketch, and this is the model, three dimensional sketch of this idea. The roadway is there, and then there's a takeoff coming down. This is a model we made <coughs> for the Corcoran exhibit. It's about 45 feet long. It's a suspension bridge, but it has only two, two foundations and no anchorages. Uh, usually the, the pylon is vertical, and you have the cables connecting the two pylons and then going down into the anchorages. So you have four very substantial foundations. In this case, the weight of this uh, pylon counterweights the weight of that pylon through the cable tension, and then the roadway in three levels in this case is supported by the cables. So there you see the, the translation from uh, this sketch. Uh, there is an hinge there, and then the pylons slanted, balancing each other. Uh, the first work I, I did around the urban problems was the Mesa City. I had a grant, so I developed this idea for a two million population uh, center. This is comparable in size to Manhattan Island. 
but it would be wasteland, uh, which means a, a mesa in the southwest. And uh, the land is somehow uh, transformed by the intervention of men. And one of the transformation, one of the most substantial was the cutting uh, in the backbone, let's say, of the city by producing uh, aggregate sand and possibly uh, cement if this is the right kind of uh, mineral. And instead of leaving this open scar, you transform it into the main park of the city. So this is a man-made landscape with its own little valleys, um, with cliffs and so on, because it would be hard stone that would be usable for um, paving or uh, building construction. And this park connects a learning center with a theological center, and then around those this center, there are four different uh, belts. One is uh, home industries and marketing. Another one is uh, an organization of villages and towns with their own civic centers. And then a long belt, which works almost as a, as a um, conveyor belt because it has some water uh, canals that are working by gravity one way and they discharge outside of the city. And this is where their main production and marketing would be of standard uh, hardware. And then outside of this belt, there was a one sunk into the, the mesa. And this is where the, the, you would regenerate and recycle all the rejects, the refuse, the garbage, the litter, the, the broken down machineries and hardware of the city. So I was trying to close the cycle that the city was opening with the, the different activities, different activities involved in it. The, the, the water was used first for domestic uses and then for uh, agricultural uses. There was production of energy through dams and so on. But it was still a two-dimensional layout and uh, he ended up by rejecting it completely. Uh, this Here's a section there of the learning center. This is one of the little villages located there. This is a, was an elevation of the uh, theological center. This was a suggestion of this landscape, which would end up by having uh, cut into the granite or uh, the, the rock uh, ro spaces like um, auditoriums, museums, shrines, and so on. This was again this uh, roll of paper. It's about 160 feet long, showing this, suggesting this landscape. This was a detail of the learning center. Some of the rolls, butcher paper that I used to sketch on. Now I'm getting into the really the subject of the. Excuse me. Would you speak a little louder? I'll try. <laughs> I'm, I have only those of those this diagrams, but I, I'll try to go through them quickly because they might help a little to understand the remaining slides. The one on the right indicates the division of uh, somehow of the reality in three main sectors, and those are never you can never divide them so so dogmatically, but it helps to understand a little at least a, a sequence of thinking. And I said, nature has gone three ways. The deterministic way, that is the universe of mass energy. And I use the name cosmogenesis. It is a entropic, statistical, rational, granular, predictable, simulable, and structural. And I call that the word of indifference. And this goes according to the law of conservation of energy. So this is the mineral and uh, uh, mass energy world. Then I have the genetic way, which is the biological universe, the biogenesis. It is instinctual, unconscious, durational, evolutionary, irreversible, selective, non-simulable, uh, simulable, no, excuse me, sensitized, social, morphological. And that's the word of innocence, the vegetal and the animal kingdom. I keep pushing the wrong button. 
And then the third segment is the cultural way or the, the human way. And see, it is the homogenesis. It's mental, conscious, durational, evolutionary, oh boy. Irreversible, Irreversible willful, non similable compassionate, social, manipulative, formal. This is the world of good and evil. The second goes by the law of concentration of energy, which, me, which means everywhere you have a manifestation of life, you have a concentration of energy, smack into the middle of it. The third goes by the, the law of incrementation of energy. And by this, I mean the incrementation of the spiritual or mental energy. So you have a process of uh, etherealization or spiritualization. You begin with the mineral universe, you end up with the spiritual universe. So we supposedly are part of this process, uh, spiritualizing matter into spirit. Here I am uh, connecting growth with uh, change, uh, somehow disconnecting growth from change. Process in manipula is manipulation by outer decision. Process belongs to the technological. Growth is manipulation by inner decision. Growth belongs to the biomental. Process is a performance of technology which acts by way of oversimplification. Growth is a per performance of the biomental which acts by way of complexification. Wherever you are, you are turning to technology, to what we call technology, to solve a problem, you are asking technology to come up with a, an oversimplified answer to this problem. That's why technology is so effective. It can uh, somehow eliminate uh, all the, the tangential and uh, uh, outer elements and go down to the, to the core of the subject and then come up with an answer. But the answer is always skeletal and not very much um, connected with the problems of human nature. Process defines changes, growth defines engrossment. Contemporary man is mesmerized by change, and I think we all know that, but it's starved by lack of engrossment, which means that change and, and uh, knowledge and growing up do not coincide. I give up on that one. On the right, I'm trying to explain <coughs> why life is implosive and non-explosive. And I'm taking the example of the seed. The vegetal, the animal, the human, and the social seed originates a cycle of gather, gathering, gathering, catering, gathering. Gathering. <laughs> a cycle of gathering and organizing matter in a progressively, progressively complex and responsive organism. So the living is then a cooperative process, not a disintegrating one. It's the co this cooperation can, that makes for the implosion. It is an implosive process, not an explosive one. It is a miniaturization process favoring the ever more complex interaction making the becoming. Wherever you have life, you have uh, a, this complexification and this miniaturization process going on uh, very powerfully. Therefore, in any given system, the liveliest quantum is also the most complex, and in any given system, the most complex quantum is also the most miniaturized. This is a, a direct relationship between matter and spirit somehow. In order to move from matter into neo-matter or from, move from the physical into the metaphysical, you need to go to the process of complexity and miniaturization. And uh, this is somehow where I get into the, the archaeological idea. And in this, in, uh, on this side, I indicate the, the connection between this archaeological commitment and the problems that we are faced with at this conjuncture of history. We have the population problem to be able to serve more people with less. We have an ecological problem which is very uh, important and very central. We have a problem of waste which is somehow connected with the problem of affluence and opulence. We have the pollution problem which is somehow uh, the most fashionable problem at this point but is faced in a, in a very superficial ways. We have the problem of land conservation, water conservation, uh, air <coughs> conservation, and so on. We have the problem of this in, the, uh, uh, desegregating 
the physical environment so we can also desegregate the non-physical environment, the social and cultural environment. And then we have a problem of energy consumption, which is absolutely central to the, all the crises that we are going to face, and we are facing already. And then there's a problem of dis disillusionment, the, the hopefulness or hopelessness, and so on. All those problems are somehow uh, looked upon through the archaeological commitment, which is somehow uh, indicating that there is a convergency of necessity, of needs, suggesting that this is the way to go. But those are only the means to a better and more full and integrated and lively kind of society. So you have the means here, the way of becoming healthy and the, the way of becoming creative. The means are necessary, but they are not sufficient. So the ecological commitment can bring us to a certain level of performance. It will never bring us to, a, to the performance itself, unless we want it. <clears throat> Some of the sketches before the, the models, those are the sketchbooks I work on. And uh, this is one of the first pages where I work on this idea. Uh, if you take this at the ground level, you have the, the below grade where you have the automatized uh, production servo systems and production system and warehousing for the community. Above ground, you have the community itself on, let's say, different layers served mainly by vertical transportation systems, small enough to be able to, to serve people without the need of massive mechanical uh, devices for moving around, which means you can walk throughout very quickly, and um, are able to use the energy, the surplus of energy from the industries, able to condition somehow not just the building, but part of the area, so the building is an open city in a way, able to allow people to be in connection, direct connection with the inside, with the institutions of the city, and also with the outdoor, let's say the institution of nature. Trying to somehow carry this idea across visually, I worked out about 40 schemes, which are just symbols. They don't have anything to do with blueprints for cities or communities. They are just uh, abstract, diagrams suggesting the variety of the, the possible once you add this third dimension in your uh, conceptual work. And some of those were floating structure. This was a sketch for this model. You have uh, centers of production. You harvest the sea, you process the materials. It can be proteins, or minerals, metals, who knows what. And then you store them, you ship them, you, you have research connected maybe with those activities, and then you have urban life above this, the water level. Once you have some of those uh, in, uh, in, at the working stage, you can connect them and then uh, somehow uh, cluster them in this way, have uh, an urban ribbon there with a park developed surrounding those units. So you have a, a developing city floating on the continental shave, shelf, for instance. Uh, another scheme, the same concept, you have the cities floating on the on water. A small town and a hub developing to a large uh, metropolitan structure. This is just the di diagram of the structure of the city. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if you are on the water still, but uh, on the anchored at the continental shelf, which means you are rooted into the continental shelf, you can have production of energy if you have a large, uh, uh, what do you call it? tides action by using water reservoirs and the gates that are allowing the water in and out uh, actioning uh, turbines so you can produce energy. We have already somehow uh, an archaeological structure in dams, but they are unfortunately f filled up with concrete. So if you can take a dam uh, before you build it, I mean design it as a cellular, as a carved out structure, you would have the room for a community. You could build a, a city into it, a village, a research center, a university, who knows what. And it's a question of designing it. And uh, you don't have to give up any, any, any strength. In fact, you can make something stronger with the same amount of material. By, by perforating it and shaping it in this way. So 
So in this case, I'm suggesting that this dam can become something like that. And in section, if you cut through here, you have the water body, you have one diaphragm facing the water, which containing the, the water basin that has a warehousing and um, industries. This one, the outside face, would be for living from homes to housing. And then the larger structure would be for um, the more public aspects of the city, from production to marketing to um, exchange, culture, health, and so on. You can have heavy industries, linear seating, take off with waterways, and so on. A dam is a very important ecological inch because it transforms uh, climate, landscape, geology, uh, ecology, and so on. And if we get to the point where we decided we want a dam, we should be very willing to make it into a lively and possibly very desirable center of life. This is a smaller one as far as structure goes. Those could be labs, those could be gardens. A much larger scheme, a multiple structure. Again, water, the water mass in the back. Those are some land ecologies. I have to caution you again in reading much more than what you see there. I think the concept is very fundamental. The illustrations are in a way irrelevant. This indicate uh, a double membrane where you have the private life again developing, and those are in suggesting neighborhoods. And the center of the city in this case would be here in this large bowl. The, the car ends, stops at the edge of the city. From there on you have public transportation but mainly you're walking, the ability to walk throughout when you don't have to go from one floor to the next. This was for about 350 or 400,000 people. It's only about one mile or so in diameter. This is a, a little smaller. It's one kilometer and a half, I think. And again, the, the outer skin, the one looking outside and inside is for the private sector and the inside is developed for the public sector. This was a double structure, about one million population. And this, di this dimension is again around two miles at the most, I think, one and a half, if I remember, if I remember. So that you have a, a very large structure, but a very minute city, which is the miniaturization question. If you adopt the scheme of the linear city, and you would have a main transportation system at the core of it, say there, that can be a continental or local, tra local transportation from rails to pneumatic transportation from, to air, then you plug in your urban systems, and by living somewhere in the, in the urban centers, you are in contact with the outside, with the outdoor, in contact with the urban institutions, and also plugged in into this main transportation system. If this was adopted, you had the problem of uh, bridging obstacles, and this was a suggestion of a linear, of a um, community of about, I don't know if it was 70,000 people. It's really a, a bridge made of two large beams, many stories high, connected transversely by those beams, which are making uh, neighborhoods and gardens and so on. This is another scheme, bridge, bridging this river. Some other less um, far out schemes in very rough models. This is about 3,000 people, that one. This is about 170,000, this 270,000, this 300, 450,000. And the Empire State Building, it's indicated there. It's a little smaller than the hair of the, my light. So another one there, another one there, which is that one. And those are some of the models in uh, plastic. This shows the uh, cutout, the inside, uh, which would be the, let's say, the cityscape. In, there is an indication of a membrane there, so this would be conditioned so that winter and summer would be a, a, a good climate. And you have many levels here, mostly uh, social and uh, marketing, commercial centers and cultural centers. 
the same uh, view. There have been so much problem with the focusing. Yeah. This is the small one, this is the larger one. This is a, really a cluster of skyscrapers, as you see them, but instead of being uh, somehow segregated and uh, uh, having only one or two functions, because they are connected only at the base, and then they stick out like skyscrapers, they are connected on many levels, so you have a good flow, a good interaction, a good uh, integration of, of activities and uh, events and so on. This is a detail of the one in the back there. This is the same one you saw the detail. The detail was uh, one of those uh, large terraces, like a park midway up. Also, this one is a cluster of vertical st structures, like skyscrapers, and then this, the, the other elements where we try to indicate the variety of, uh, of environments that you can produce. Uh, the detailing, let's say, where you could build different buildings with different function and keep renewing those buildings, uh, changing them, rebuilding them, and so on. This was one of the most the, um, abstract. I had a cube. I choose a cube of one kilometer, and I try to somehow shape it, uh, cut in the inside, uh, organize the inside into a, a building for about 400 and, and so thousand people. And those are, again, like skyscrapers. And then all those exteriors uh, structures are for the uh, private activities of the community. There is a landing there. And then the inside for the other functions. In the MIT book, I have uh, this asteroid for about 70,000 people. The only suggestion here was that if we had to go in, into space, which we will eventually, I guess. We should try to bring some of the biological aspects of the Earth in this monstrous gadgets. So this, this is a cylinder, you see half of the model here, and it's rotating on this axis. So you have zero gravity, weightlessness, and then you move, you get become heavier. And this is a, a, it's like a landscape lined with vegetation, which is part of the metabolic cycle. You stand inside of this landscape instead of standing on top of it, as we do on this earth. So you are inside of a landscape that surrounds you. There's also waterway there surrounding, let's say, the center of the city. All this thing is in tension because you have, you have a, an atmosphere pushing against the vacuum of space. And you can move out from your living space and you float in this and you go do your own business in this environment, which is uh, somehow surrounded by the non-environment of space. This is an example of miniaturization by necessity, by utter necessity. This was a scheme uh, worked out when the Radcliffe University asked me to do some work on, uh, on this idea because they felt that this was the only answer to the problem of pollution. And I think they are damn right. Um, then motor com the Ford Motor Company got, got interested in, uh, in the transportation system because they found out that we had no cars inside of the scheme. So this is the hub you see there. It's an airport that has become a city of uh, one million population. It's 800 meters high, two and a half kilometers inside. It's, the, uh, it's immersed into uh, parks, and the parks are covering the industrial parks and the landing happens according to the wind pattern. This is in the meadows between New York and Newark. The wind patterns, this one defining the landing strips, then the aircrafts are uh, um, pulled in or taken out from this taxiing ring, 
which is where the, the loading and unloading of passengers and freight happens. So you practically load in, inside of a city instead of loading in a known place, which is what uh, an airport is. Thank you. This is a, a large, somehow scary model of this idea. It's cardboard, masonite, and plywood. And it shows the, the industrial parks below the gardens, the taxing, the, the warehousing, the main, again, uh, private sector of the city, including those skyscrapers, and the bulk of the city activities at this level. There are gardens at different levels. This is one of the gardens. There's a promenade there, four miles, I think, promenade. A, bri a suspended bridge surrounding the, the structure. For this scheme, we, uh, we had the, those diagrammatic sections and we indicated it in time, in minutes, and uh, distances, in feet, the separation between events. And we have um, a serviceman, I think, an out-of-town executive, trying to show that because of the smallness of the structure, you can uh, be very active inside. You don't have to, you don't have intervals of, uh, of many minutes or possibly hours between uh, between different events, so that you can you can touch upon different performances and do it swiftly and possibly pleasantly because the environment could be very not just pleasant but very exciting. And you move by elevators, by escalator, by walking or moving sidewalks, bicycles and uh, scooters and so on. This was a, a housewife. This was done before the lib came in. And finally, the Arcosanti project. Thank you. It was a scheme designed at the beginning when I was doing the, the work on the Mesa City, so it was pretty much scattered. It was using a uh, good part of the land that we were trying to, uh, to buy at that time. We didn't succeed in buying the land, and then I was changing my approach to the, this problem, to the community, organizing of structure for communities. So I took a small part of this building, which is here, and I worked it into a much larger structure, which is the one we are trying to build now. And um, by enlarging the structure to a point, we, we got the structure itself somehow opening up so that those walls became 17 feet separated, a double membrane 17 feet apart. And that's the smallest module for this building. I'll show it to you a little later on. We have a, a one small module kind here for living and working, a larger module in the columns, uh, a different module on those beams, two different modules on the, on the roof structure, and then a larger terrace here with, where you can build a home in here. This is very schematic. And uh, this is the land we are, uh, uh, we are buying. It's 860 acres. It's a little ranch. We are... Uh, we have about three miles of this little river, so we have water, we have uh, large trees, it's a little canyon-like. We are building on this basaltic kind of structure, we are building on top of one of the shelves, and the building is about as tall as the shelf itself. This is the camp we spent most of the time to build last year. Those are cubic, this is the view from the, from the actual building side, the camp is down there. We own this land and about two and a half miles be in the back. This is farmland we're going to use later on. And this is the assemblage of those cubicles for uh, sleeping quarters for the participant. They are about eight feet and a half inside, in size. And uh, we have some larger, about 12 feet. That now they are enclosed, so that when it rains, we have a place to stay. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, this is a shower and uh, toilets before the finishing. Um, this is the, the shelf on which we are building the uh, Arcosanti. We began the b working there. 
those are the this the camp with the cubicles this uh, organic garden will be processed the garbage will make compost this is the 12 foot cubicle one of them there we are you can see again the the, the site of the building it will go from here to there it will be about that tall about 30 25 uh, Stay, um, uh, floors. Uh, we are setting up a little studio for myself there, a 12 foot cube. This is a, an octagon, it's a, a communal space when it rains or when it's windy or so on. And uh, it's the same area, one of the columns, 30 columns that we have in the building, we'll have in the building there, so we have a, an idea of the floor area, floor space. We are precasting and assembling. There's a girl there that operates the crane, has been doing that for a year now. She's back on the spot now, working. So this is the camp, and which will be later on a camping ground for people visiting for one night or two, or a, a playground. And now we are concentrating on the building, on the, on the mesa. This is, I'll show you the model later on. It's a, it's a batching plant. We do metal work here on the other side. We do woodwork. This is symmetrical. It's a bolt of 60 feet. It has two arches supporting a crane, a horizontal crane. Then there is an office here and two living quarters, one here and one on the other side. And this is on the main, on the short axis of the whole building, which will be in the back there. This is the foundation of one of those sides. It's pretty heavy because of the crane. This is on the, on the west side of this structure and it's uh, the, the new ceramics workshop. It's an apse, much larger than one in, uh, our Kozan in Kozanti. It's facing south, so we have ceramics work here. We have rooms in case of bad weather. And this is a, under the center of the very, another very, la very large apse you'll see in the model. Yeah. This is the actual site of this vault where we do the precasting. This is a panel of my studio. I'm working with the idea of using silt as a parting uh, matter, material so that we get the same kind of color of the land. The silt is from the riverbed. This is this panel before the casting. This is linoleum painted yellow. When you pull, up, pull it off, you have that yellow. Yeah. This is pulled off. This is still there, the linoleum. <clears throat> and this is the vault. It's uh, it's made on in four of those se sections. We divided in three segments. Instead of using um, a wood form, we used the silt form. We got the silt from the riverbed. We molded and then uh, we painted the silt or we painted linoleum in those patterns. Now we are casting it and then we are going to pile them, uh, storing them there until we are ready for the assemblage. And we haven't been doing that, we haven't done that yet. We are just beginning now to clearing out the area. We are cutting, we are dynamiting now to make the batching plant bigger. This is the linoleum, you see there. This is silt painted with cement colors. This is a very schematic design, an early design of this building. It shows the use of those uh, spherical structures for two main reasons. One is they produce different climates, sheltered climates inside there. This in the south, we are going to have very good areas for summer and winter work here for ceramics, metal, and other activities, playgrounds. We are going to have a different kind of light and climate here because it's facing north, northwest, the same for the north north east side and the same for the for the east and same for the west so we are going to produce different conditions where to work in in the open but shelter the other reason for using this structure is that they are very strong and they are going to support the roof they're going to support a bridging structure there they're going to support a, a floating structure there through cables they're enclosing the building but without and leaving also very large 
glazed areas because of the shape. And then they, they define environments 